Welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. I'm your host, Beth Stallwood, and in this episode, I am joined by Gary Turner. And Gary is such an interesting thinker and actor. I mean, actor in the terms of doing acts versus actor on the stage. He's a person who works as a senior leader in industry. And he has been on a journey, oh, cheesy word alert, of discovery about things around vulnerability and courage and stepping up in work and being yourself and the power of values and behaviours in terms of working in business. And I asked Gary to come on because so many of us, including myself in this world, are people who work as coaches and advisors and consultants. And I thought it'd be really interesting to get the internal perspective of somebody who's doing this type of work internally with a job um, as a worker in an organisation, as a leader in an organisation. And we have a really interesting conversation about the where he's been, how he's got there, and actually how so much of this stuff that I talk about a lot around work joy and we talk about a lot on the podcast doesn't just have results for you personally in terms of you feeling more joyful, but he's seen a direct link between that and better innovation and better revenue growth, um, which he attributes to doing some stuff differently. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. Today, I am having a lovely conversation with Gary Turner. And rather than me introduce him, I'm going to hand over to Gary. Gary, tell us a bit about yourself, your story, and how you came to be where you are today. Thank you very much, uh, Beth. I'll try and do that in less than two minutes. <laughs> Go for it. Um, so very quick. So my name's Gary Turner. I'm based in the UK. I am a happily married man to my wife and step t- stepdad to a couple of lovely children and also a fur daddy, which is really exciting. And I think the where I am right now, Beth, is on the journey. And I'm on the journey of emergence. And what that means is I have a day job where I work at a three and a half billion turnover global corporate. But whole Gary, and this is the exploration I'm still on, is a whole person that cares deeply about people. Uh, qualified in organizational design, L&D, chartered member of the CIPD, so sort of peopled up, but also have extensive international experience uh, with developing people and businesses. And I'm just in that emergent space, um, Beth, of really bringing all of that stuff together so that I can show up as whole Gary. And I'll probably leave it there for right now. Love it. Uh, great intro there. Um, so the first thing, because I'm obsessed with fur babies because I have my own, is what fur baby do you have? <laughs> we have a wonderful cockapoo called Winnie. Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> I have a a mixed breed who's also a bit of a poo and she's called Mabel and she almost got called Winnie. So there you go. We're in a, uh, a very similar world with our fur babies and I'm completely obsessed with mine. So that's great. And I, I'm really interested in this idea of how you're on the journey. And isn't it interesting that aren't we all on a journey? And I know that's a bit of a cheesy overused phrase at the moment, but we're never really complete, are we? And I'm interested in how you're thinking about your kind of corporate life and what you're doing and bringing the whole of you together. So tell me a little bit more about the journey you've been on to get there and and what you're still working on. No, sure. Thanks for the question, Beth. I think that there's probably... All of this stuff is fluid, isn't it? And first of all, yes, we are always, always on a journey. We're never the polished article. My goodness, do I know that, having (laughs) offered out a microaggression just last week by accident. Um, (laughs) Whoops, exactly. Um, But I think what's really interesting for me, that there's there's almost been like stages. So the first big stage for me, Beth, was back five years ago when I turned 39, and it wasn't at all a midlife crisis. I joke about this a lot. It was really a midlife awakening from the point of view that I woke up from the need to be attached to the car, the job, the identity that I will be okay when I've made enough money, when I've got the car and I've got the house and the perfect life. And it sounds ridiculous when I'm talking to you now, but it's very, very innocent and, of course, very systemic, particularly in the West. When we look at education, the stories our parents tell ourselves and the stories we tell ourselves. And this is the big thing I'd like to leave the first answer with, and that is, I was bullied. I was bullied psychologically and physically for for two years, age 12, 13. 
And I held on to the stories. I held on to the feeling of not enoughness after that experience. And what that led to was dysfunction throughout my early teens, self-harming, failed first marriage, <laughs> burnt myself out. You know, and none of those things were causal to that, but it was all stories. I just held on to these unnecessary fear-based stories of not enough following being bullied as a kid. And guess what, Beth? The following day, those kids probably barely thought about that. Yeah, I held on to it for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, and it, that's, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that because it is a, a challenging thing to be able to open up about. And it's so great when people do because that vulnerability to share that is such a story that I hear so much. And when we talk about work joy as a concept and as something that you can do, a lot of people who I coach around this are in the same world that they're holding on to stories that might have been true 20 years ago but probably weren't even true at that point in time there was something that you were told and you believed um you know people who are in their 40s now kind of going oh but I'm I'm, I'm not very academic it's like whoa how does that even matter in your <laughs> life right now that you weren't very good at passing exams we all know that that's a bit ridiculous anyway so it's really interesting about those fear-based stories and I'd be interested to know from you and I think our audience would be too is but letting go of that isn't easy. And I'd love to know for you, how did you recognize it, first of all, recognize that that was what was going on? I mean, it sounds like you're awakening, midlife awakening. I'm totally going to call it that. <laughs> I love that. It's much better than crisis. Awakening is what's really happening here. Um, how did you then, when you recognized it, move past it and get past it to be able to not perhaps live with so much fear or have so many fear-based stories in your head? Yeah, so the first thing I would say, and it links to your point about vulnerability, which, of course, something I, I talk a lot about myself, but asking for help, Beth. And when I say yeah. asking for help, I mean getting a coach and paying, because I was one of these people as well. And again, no judgment in this. It's very innocent. I, working in corporate as I still do, I believed, as Gary, it was the organization's responsibility to develop me and to make sure I'm safe and happy and well. And of course, there is an element of truth in that. But fundamentally, it was all down to me. It's the stories again. So what I did is I actually just went, I wonder what it'd be like if I invested in some coaching. Never had the experience before. I can't really expect my organization to spend, you know, three grand on it for me at this time. So I invested in myself and it was an incredible experience across six sessions. And that was the start, um, Beth, of the, I'd say it's like the, the first ripple in an ocean of potential within me that just got totally unleashed during those six sessions. And the reason why is that the coach at the time helped me realize that what I was dealing with was emotional suppression. I just did not have the emotional maturity between age 12 and 39 to even vocalize what I was, what I had experienced or what I'd been experiencing the following 20 years. So it's so it really asking for help, being vulnerable, not needing all the answers. It was in that moment um, that everything started to shift. Great. And, and that thing in there about asking for help and investing in yourself. And a big part of the work joy theory of life is that you are responsible for yourself. Mm -hmm. Your organization can help you. They can support you. Sometimes they don't. And that's awful. Sometimes they can only support you in a certain way. And, it, it you know, it, your organization can't be responsible for the emotional development of every person <laughs> there. It's just not realistic to expect that. Yet our expectations about organizations versus our expectations of ourselves are often very different. So it sounds like you kind of really took uh, the ball by the horns and went, no, actually, I need to do something for me. I need to invest in myself. I need to find a way through this. And it sounds like that opened up your thinking, was able to take you to the next step on your journey. 100%. Absolutely. And I, re I really want to hold space for a second, Beth, and acknowledge that not everybody on this planet has got the ability to spend three grand on coaching to be do some self-development. So I want to hold that that space. But I also want to reinforce the importance of that accountability that you speak to. It costs nothing to reach out to someone on LinkedIn and say, hi, can we meet up? No agenda. Just want to learn more about you and your work. I do it all of the time. And I get some of the biggest learning experiences by doing that and not spending thousands. Absolutely. And it's, it's a really good point to make. And thank you for doing it is that we do not expect everybody to be able to do that. And it's not the right thing for everybody. But a big part of what I know about the, even just things like your own personal well being, if you're not even thinking about your career or anything in that world, is the, the emotional stuff, the suppression, the things that get you down, the imposter syndrome, whatever it is that isn't quite working for you in your head right now, it thrives in silence. And it's able to get deeper and deeper into your 
you know, subconscious and make you feel worse if you don't talk about it. So even if you don't have a coach, not everyone has a coach, but you might have people that you trust, that you admire, that you can talk to. Start having the conversations with them and see where it leads you. Or as you said, like reach out to people. Who is it that you think is interesting? Find them. The worst they can say is no, right? And you're no worse off in a position than you were <laughs> before you asked. So um, yeah, it, it's a really good point. But it is that there's so many things you can do. There's so many free things online now. There's TED Talks. There's different ways you can think about your own development that just require a little bit of effort versus a big investment. Yeah, love that, Beth. Love that. So tell me, once you had awakened yourself, um, what were the next steps you took to be able to move towards where you are today? Yeah, so, so it's been, there's been a number of avenues, Beth, but I think the, the biggest ones I would say is community. So you've got your, the community you're developing, you know, around work joy. I've got the communities around me in different areas and it's really tapping into and being very intentional about being part of growth fueled, inclusive, diverse communities. And as I stepped into that, and it wasn't always conscious, I must be honest, I sort of fell into the first one a few years ago, which was actually the humans first community who, who, who are amazing. But as I stepped into that and realized there are other people, Beth, like you and I and many others that actually do want to become a better, bigger, more impactful, more humane version of themselves. There are a lot of other people on that same journey and community, I believe, was a critical next step. So whatever that community is, and some people find it in different places, some people find it at work, some people find it in their faith, some people find it in a community of professionals, some people find it just in, you know, in their friends is to really tap into that community and to talk to people like have a conversation and one of the things we all think is that we're the only ones struggling with something we're the only people who think like that and when you start being that vulnerable person and opening up and asking questions and finding out we often find that everyone is actually just making up as they go along we're all in that world because like there is no guidebook to being yourself you have to work it out yourself and there's no guidebook to being a human again what is it that you, you value what is it that's important to you how do you become that person that you want to and I you know I, I like your phrase it's like, like that better bigger and more humane version of yourself well you will only work that out by doing something about it it doesn't just come to you magically one day yeah I really like that and uh, I really really like that statement because I, I think also I've been guilty in the past um, Beth of you know everyone knows about the secret and you know if you manifest it it'll land like I don't think anything's manifested by me just sitting in the garden waiting for it to land so um there's definitely an element of intention and action required for sure (laughs) totally and actually I always say that if you take one step forward some of the other stuff will look after itself so it's not like you have to work really hard at everything but you know just sitting in the garden and waiting for a magic light bulb to appear over your head probably isn't going to happen but having a conversation with someone while you're sitting in the garden that might spark a little bit of something in your mind might allow the little light bulb to come on and might allow you to feel like this is where I can head to and this is what I can do. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And I'm going to take your metaphor. Let's keep the metaphor of the garden going. One of my biggest realisations, even in the last 12 months as part of the journey I'm on, Beth, has been getting out into nature. Like the pandemic has been horrific on many, many levels. And on other paradoxical levels, it's been an absolute godsend from the point of view of, I have meetings now with my colleagues in nature. I go for walk and talks for hours with my line manager. We did not do that pre-pandemic. And the richness and innovation and insight and connection and collaboration that comes out of getting out of the boxes that we've lived in and that we keep ourselves within has been a truly transformational part of this journey so far. And uh, it's so lovely. I, I totally um, believe in the the power of actually just getting outside, getting some fresh air. If you can do that, if you can go on a walking meeting, if you can get yourself out of any kind of box. And I would say there's mental boxes as well as the physical boxes that we put ourselves in is that, you know, you might have put yourself in a box that says I can't do this because I was bullied when I was a child and that's limited me or some people put themselves in a box of I'll never be able to do that or I could never make that happen because there's so many reasons why the answer could be no but actually if we think about how do we take ourselves out of those boxes and how do we give ourselves the opportunity to make great things happen and by this I don't mean and people always think about this when I I talk about work as a concept they think oh is that about being happy 100% of the time 
And I'm like, oh, no, it's definitely <laughs> not about that. It's about actually noticing what brings you some joy, doing more of it, understanding that there is no such thing as 100% joyful life because challenges happen, bad things happen. Um, there will always be people that annoy you. There'll always be IT that doesn't work. There'll always be something that gives you a little bit of the work bloom. But how do you manage that? And what's the attitude you bring to it? Will hopefully, if you can start to really understand it, bring you more joy more often. And that joyful moment helps you get through the stuff that isn't so good. Yeah, that, that's such an insightful um, statement for me. So, so just to bring this to life for your audience today that are kindly joining us. Like literally three days ago, I was in an absolute tiz. I was out in nature doing what I love doing. And I just had a head on. Absolute like, this is awful. This is a pain. There was absolutely zero rhyme nor reason to why I felt that way. It was just one of those days. But what I've learned the last couple of years is that, that, that people talk about it's okay to, to not be okay. It yeah. even comes to that level of just because you're in your head for half an hour about something that seems really insignificant, it will pass. And what I have spoke about for a while, Beth, is emotions are just a data point of where our thinking is in that moment, not the second before, not the second after, right in that moment. There is no need to attach anything to what we thought about or felt in that moment. That is so true. I often use the phrase, this too will pass. Is <laughs> it? And, and I was talking to some people yesterday, very similar. You know, you had a, a like, I'd probably call that I had a cob on. Like, saying you're in that zone. <laughs> like, you just, you got out of bed the wrong side. There's no rhyme or reason for it. You're just feeling moody. That is something that happens to absolutely everyone. And sometimes we go in two different directions. And I was talking to a group of people about this um, yesterday, is that sometimes we go in the direction of, I need to move past this because this feeling is not good and we don't want to be here. So I'm going to rush through it and I'm going to find a way of not feeling that. Or sometimes we get the other end of the spectrum, which is we get so stuck in that feeling that we then perpetuate whatever it is that's making that feeling happen. And what I always talk about is how about rather than trying to rush through it, we just recognize what it is. We might name that emotion. And this sounds a little bit like psychological, like wishy-washy stuff. But honestly, sometimes if I sit there and I name the emotion, I might initially name that emotion I'm feeling grumpy. And then what I might name it is actually I'm tired. Like I, there's a reason for this emotion. I'm really tired and I haven't looked after myself very well. So what is the next step I could take to move myself one little bit further towards not being grumpy? Well, how about tonight you get a decent night's sleep? There's an action. And one step forward is always like the best way of doing it. So that might be like not trying to rush through it, but trying to understand it versus trying to get rid of it. So understand it, move past it. And that's a really simple explanation because sometimes it's not just that you haven't sleep. There might be something deeper going on within your head. But that thing that it will pass if you recognize it and move through it, I think is a really important thing for us all to consider. And and to remember that it's okay to have a bad day. That is part <laughs> of it. Um, sometime, and sometimes, here's the thing that people don't think I'm going to say, but I am going to say it. It's okay to have a day or so wallowing in some mood. If that's what you need right then, that's all right. As long as you find a way out of it eventually. <laughs> oh, I, I, love, I love this conversation. But the, the, thing, the thing that you're also speaking to for me is we are all innately yeah, going to get a bit spiritual woo-woo here. We are all part of nature. We are all connected. We are Before the layers come on, the thinking, the fears, the anxiety, the hope, the joy, we are all actually part of one singular human race. And I want to emphasize that point with everything that's going on in the outside world. We are made of the same stuff. And when we realize that, we tend to give ourselves permission to sit in that feeling a bit more. Because you go, oh, if I'm feeling it, then someone else is bound to be. So let's just go through it. Let's just sit in it a bit longer because we are all made of the same stuff. Definitely. Uh, and it, I don't mind going a bit spiritual if that's where we need to go. I think one of the things I would probably add to that is this idea, and I am not a neuroscientist, so I'll caveat like what I say now with my very basic understanding of science. And, you know, when we go back to what happened at school, science, my science teachers will tell you, was not my strongest point in school. But we'll, we'll go with it for a moment is that, the, that what they're looking at now when they do all these amazing like functional MRI scans and start to really understand what's going on in your brain is that humans feel before we think. So the feeling happens, the emotions happen before any kind of logic is applied to it. So you have to, if you want to apply logic to emotion, you have to understand what the emotion is first. You can't just apply logic and go, well, I can just get rid of that. 
because mm-hmm. it's so deeply human to feel before you think about something. Yeah, just like, such a good ad. That's such a good ad because when I think about what brings me joy, for example, it is that that experience of connection and growth and debate and challenge and imagining. And a lot of that stuff does start as a feeling. Like I've never, ever had an innovation that's come from just my head. It's always been, as we always joke, don't we? It's in the shower, it's going for a run. It's it's what it's when you're least yeah. likely to be thinking about anything that those insights arise. Uh, I think that, that what they say is that it's the physical repetitive motion that helps your brain get there. And whatever's happening subconsciously or going on in your brain is that that feeling, that emotion, then you get like a little bit excited about something. You're like, ah, oh, why am I excited about that? Oh, hang on a minute. That's something a bit innovative. That's something a bit creative that I could take and apply some of that logic so all of this amazing learning I have in my human brain at however many years old I am I can apply that logic to that feeling and see what happens there versus logic it and then see how you feel so it's working with your what's going on in your brain versus working against it yeah very cool very cool yeah you're definitely doing neuroscience better than me today so you should definitely got an A for your science Beth (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I definitely I think I like by the skin of my teeth scraped to see in science um like scraped and had to work very hard at it it does not come naturally to me um give me English or some drama or some music and I'll be there but yeah the other stuff not so much but we can't all be good at everything right that is not how we work absolutely absolutely so what I'd love to do now if you're okay if we kind of go down another pathway is you're obviously in the corporate world still. You're a leader in your organization. You're you're on this journey of awakening yourself. How has that influenced how you show up at work and how you lead others at work? God, that is a very, very insightful question. Um, it's been significant and it's been, but there's been some, some work again, because let me just, let me just respond by starting with, I think the psychological and emotional contract at work is fundamentally broken. And what I mean by that, and we will come back to joy, <laughs> but what I, what, what I mean by that Go is... Go down the dark side first, we'll yeah, bring the light yeah, side yeah. back. Yeah, it's, it, we, are, we are all of it, aren't we? So we need to go for yeah. both. So what I mean by that is I still think, and I certainly suffer from this, that we, we tend to have, if we're in a corporate role, a belief that the company owns us. So therefore, our lives are completely at the behest of the organization who pays our salary. And what it took me a while to work out is, as long as I am doing a very good job of what we have mutually agreed is my job, I can show up in whatever other way I want to, as long as I don't bring the company to disrepute. But that took me five years to work through, Beth. And I'm now at a stage right now in this moment, and I'll come back to the difference it's made for me showing up fully, like we we actually added eight uh, six million in sales and one and a half million in gross margin across my international sales team between 2015 and 2018 by just intentionally shifting how we came together, changed our meeting structures, challenged the values that we had, held space for debate healthily. We added six million, and there's no other change apart from how we came together. Market dynamics stayed the same, exactly the same personnel, and what this brought was this awareness that by me being on my journey and me bringing in with curiosity and courage and just a desire for me and us to be better, we added this incredible value. And it wasn't just because of me, I was the catalyst, but the team then came with that journey because who doesn't want to be in an innovative, co-creative, experimental, life-giving team? And that's what we co-created. And more and more of that is starting to seep in. So the more that I show up, the more value my organization gets. It's so interesting. And I'm going to come back on a few points that you just said there. So number one, anyone who's ever thought that what we talk about here on WorkJoy is a little bit fluffy, which I know that some people do, £6 million is quite a big jump, isn't it, in um, sales (laughs) revenue over that period. That is not something that is intangible. Now, a lot of, and I will will put it out there, a lot of the stuff that we talk about can't be measured in that way, but that's Mm -hmm. a really great, example of actually the link direct link between how you've shown up and how you 
are the catalysts for making a different type of conversation happen for a different type of connection for a different type of innovation actually leads to better results than if you turned up thinking that the business owned you and you have to do exactly what you know put, put you in a box and do exactly what the box says so that's a really interesting um example there about that how do you show up more to actually have a better result uh but the other thing i just wanted to come back to is that didn't happen overnight so anyone who is thinking Mm -hmm. that this is a silver bullet quick win this is it you're done it's not is it reality check it's not like that 100 percent not like that and in fact i can even and again I'm, i'm not i'm speaking as gary and not as my employer today but i had a wonderful catch up with my line manager literally two hours before we came on here today beth and we're reviewing some of the really good work we did back in 2016 why because it isn't embedded as much as we thought it could be and should be but because of the advent of technology you know how it's how we're, we're rapid adoption of it during during the pandemic we're super excited by revisiting that stuff and co-creating with the team in a way that we didn't five years ago. So yes, like we've been on the journey five years and we're going to go back to some of the steps where we faltered several years ago. So we added all of that value, yet we are nowhere near from being finished and never will be. And so is that genuine curiosity, vulnerability and desire to stay in a creative journey and to not be stuck on the number because that, those numbers Beth they were the outcome of us doing this we didn't go out to add six million one and a half million we went out to be better as a team knowing in, innately that if we get out of our own way and reduce friction in processes and how we communicate and work together nothing else can happen apart from add more value yeah and it's so obvious isn't it is that um what <laughs> Like when you just look at it like that, it's like if we work better together, if we get rid of stuff that's stopping us being great at our job, it will be better. Yeah, in the business world, in the corporate world, wherever you work, actually, all of those things feel like such a massive headache. And you're so focused on that big number sometimes, like we've got to get better at sales, we've got to get better at sales, that you focus on sales versus focusing on what's stopping us getting there what's the actual real challenge here and then focusing on that so I would love it if you could give us just some real concrete examples of some of the things you did to make like co-creation happen to be more curious to get the team really flying what were some of the practical things that people might go oh that's a bit of inspiration for me as a leader what I can go and do with my team so yeah so Beth we did a number of different things within the team so one of the key things which is a really simple intervention which I think we forget to do is we reviewed our meeting structure so actually why do we do meetings how do we organize them who do we hear from how do we communicate during them and honestly that was probably one of the most transformational changes we moved from deaf by powerpoint and consider we are an international sales team so a number of our colleagues are actually translating in their head from their mother tongue into English so we standardized the process, we standardized the, the PowerPoint presentation, and we moved from basically what was 95% focus on metrics to a 90% focus on how do we make sure we can remove the roadblocks collectively that stop us being brilliant as a team. So I think that's probably one of the biggest ones. Really simple intervention, but it took an intentional slowing down and bringing together of the team to, to review it. That was one of the big ones. And and like something anyone can go and do, right? You can say, this is my team. What meetings are we having? How can we be better at that? What are we focusing on? Is what we're focusing on actually producing what we want it to produce? What else should we be thinking about? And I love the idea, and it links into one of our previous um, podcasters, which is Kath Bishop, around the long win, is that let's stop focusing so much on metrics and focus more on how we go about achieving some of the things that we want to achieve. And that 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 difference there obviously really helps and something so simple. So thank you. What other examples have you got for us? Yeah, so another one which is still work in progress, to be honest. Again, it's one of the things we discussed again today is is values. So mm. previously, back in the earlier days, back in 2015, 2016, the organization didn't really have clarity around the behaviors and what values the business stood for. Because you know, we're a money-making machine like many, many other corporates. So we lacked that clarity around what it meant to be together as human beings. So we decided to create a team set of um, values. But, and this is where we learned a lesson, Beth, is my line manager and I done a lot of the work and then sort of offered that for approval 
rather than doing a full co-creation job, it won't surprise you to know that they did not embed particularly well. Um, yeah. so, so, so... Values 101, <laughs> work with the people. Exactly. But but again, you know, you know, part of this journey we're all on, What part of the joy of the journey for me is that failing, that mucking up, that learning and iterating as we go. And that was, so we're actually reviewing that um, situation right now around the values and actually are they the right values? We've now got corporate values. How aligned should they be? But again, everything, as in everything that is structural within this team of 15 people, is under a discussion now. None of it is dictated. And I think that would be an invitation I'd offer your listeners is which of your processes or how do you come together as humans in a way that you tell rather than ask and and, and genuinely collaborate? Because that is where the friction is and that's where the money's been lost. Yeah. For sure. And uh, and you think this thing is, isn't it, is that you don't know until you've tried it and you tried it one way. And now you're like, no, that isn't the way we want to do it now. We want to make sure it is something where we come together, where we get people's perspectives, where we find a way to do it together. And it's interesting because you probably now, it sounds like you're in the zone of one of your values would be around something around co-creation versus, um, you know, telling people what things are. So you're, 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 well, I don't really like the word failure, but you called it a failure, so I'm going to yeah. call it a failure. The, fa- the <laughs> failure, uh, I just think there's so much negative connotation with failure as opposed to actually it's how we learn and how we get better. But but what you've done there is your failure has told you more about the values that you need to have anyway. So it's like that ongoing process of learning and development and improvement is it just tells you something every time you fail at that. Have you got one more real concrete example that you could share with us as well? I've, what I would like to share with you is the what I would call the innovation space. So this is, we are intentionally now as a team, um, we have learning development. Um, again, I've mentioned earlier that I've sort of done, done quite a bit of space uh, work myself around that area. And we now have a team learning development um, structure, not, not dictated by the corporate. It's not signed off by anybody. It's co-created by the team for the team based on what the team needs. Of course, we bring in external help as and when that's necessary, but 90% of what we need, we already know. Like We know what doesn't work. We know what can be improved, but it takes vulnerability and humility in a safe safe enough, brave space to be able to do that. And we're gradually getting better, Beth, at creating and co-creating that, that safe, brave space. And we're now seeing the innovation benefit of that and its significance, such as, um, you know, without sharing too much sort of IP again I don't want to speak too much on behalf of the company but 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 let's just say there are some things we're now doing in our particular market that nobody else is doing and those innovations would not have come up which are leading directly to joy in people's roles to bottom line performance enhancements and that those innovations would not have come about had we have continued the way we were five years ago um it's, it's a great example in that getting that safe space for innovation and it, so many organizations are wanting innovation to be the thing right they want innovation they want to be able to kind of beat the competitors in the marketplace yet so many of them they have so much focus on the current metrics and the day job and working you know the eight till eight or whatever it is vibe in an organization that nobody is working on innovation there isn't that space for it there isn't that openness um time dedication and intent around it even though you want it so finding that space and making it happen sounds like it it made a real difference yeah absolutely it's it's huge and and again i just want to add something in here as well do get external help when you need it but your people have got so much insight so much knowledge so much wisdom don't keep doing the hard route of trying to make it come top down or from those with power your people yeah. are waiting to be unleashed and it's so such a waste of human potential if we don't and one of the interesting things there is so often people get in people to come and tell you the problem it's like well you could have asked three people in your team <laughs> and found out what the problem was <laughs> you didn't need to pay somebody to do that and my advice here and i you know <laughs> i'll pitch it out there is if you're getting external help get external help to release the insight to gather the knowledge to understand the wisdom within your people not to tell you what you should be able to do it's like if you need a bit of help to make that safe space if you need a bit of help to facilitate some thinking or to get to the bottom of what their ideas are that I think will always be money well spent versus get someone else to tell you what your problem is yeah that is such an incredibly rich insight and and why is that so important Beth 
because everybody's unique business is in a separate context. There is no one size fits all. For, it does, it does, I go crazy with some of these models. Look, it works over here for Google. You can do it here in the chemical industry. Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is as well is that I always think and some people think I'm crazy for saying it but the answers are already in the room you know if you were in a, meet- a t- meeting where you're actually in a room together the answers are in the room they're in the virtual room they're on the zoom call that you have you just haven't listened or explored or asked the right question yet um or given the right culture where people can speak up and say what they're thinking but the answers are always there I honestly believe that. Um, some people think I'm mad, but I, I'm all right with that because I, I, <laughs> I think that either people in your team have infinite potential to have the answer or the innovation or to find a solution to the problem that you have. You just haven't given the right conditions to make that happen yet. And it's what it's and what I'm really reflecting on with this conversation, Gary. And thank you so much for sharing all of these things. Is that what you did was you were on a mission to create the conditions for success. Yes, hundred, hundred percent, and I think I'd love to add to that as well. That mostly I can't be completely ego free. I don't think any of us can. But the majority of why I've done what I've done is nothing to do with me. It's not been about promotion. It's not been about trying to be seen for being A, B, or C. It's literally been because I believe in better. Literally. Yeah. So stepping out from that, what could I get from this? And being like, how can it just be better? Is a real way of helping make great things happen um right i'm gonna i'm gonna move on um time wise to make sure we 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 get to the end point um i am gonna ask you some quick fire questions if that's all right for you absolutely beth fire away right so my first one and i want you to kind of dig deep personally here for you so not about what you've experienced in your team or you know any of those things but for you what's one thing that in a day is always guaranteed to bring you some work joy Human connection, simple as that. Rich, deep human connection. Love that, and it's so important. Is it like conversations? What's going on? How you connect with people can bring you amazing amounts of joy. So, thank you for sharing. Um, what are you, book are you currently reading? What's on your reading list? I've got such a ridiculously long reading list. I don't get through it quick enough, Beth. But I've got a whole book <laughs> for stuff to read. But I really, I, I'm going to come back to Quick Fire. So Quick Fire is a book called Regenerative Leadership by Laura Storm and Giles Hutchins, and it is completely mind blowing. Oh, I've not heard of it. Tell me a little bit more if you can. For sure. Um, as I've stepped more into this sort of trying to understand how we are all part of nature, literally, as human beings, what they've come up with is a not a, 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 like a, a mechanistic model. They've come up with very much an organic model of organisational design, which is very much in line with nature's systems. So they talk about the story of separation. They talk about balancing masculine and feminine energy more effectively. How it's just, if you have any interest at all in not just agile, that's part of this, but in creating the conditions, use your language, Beth, beautifully, to allow your people to thrive in line with natural systems whilst they're developing life-giving practices, not just regular, more of the same or extractive practices, but practices that truly give life to the organisation, the people, then you need to read this book. Like, it's completely different. It does touch on, like, Frederick Lelou's Reinventing Organisations and other type that sort of ilk, but this is something truly game-changing that I truly believe is going to nudge um, humanity forward. And I don't say that lightly. Wow. It sounds amazing. It's going on my list. I'm going to get it um, delivered and I will give it a read. Thank you for sharing. Um, I would love to know in your life so far, um, what's the best or most useful bit of advice that somebody has given you that you always find yourself coming back to and referring to and using yourself? Yeah, so many. I'm going to use a. I'd love to. I'd love to give you something from someone really wise that I know closely, but I can't give you that. Not because I don't know wise people, Beth. Just because nothing comes to mind. But there's something that I do always come back to, and it's from the wonderful Brené Brown. And it's. I love Brené. Like all hail, <laughs> I am like all hail Queen Brené. I think she should be in charge of the world. So I'm very happy for you to quote Brené. Brilliant. So what it is, and I do come back to this genuinely from the bottom of my heart a lot, that is people are always doing the best they can in that moment. So they could be as horrifically, you know, could be the horrific negative side or the super positive side of experience of life. 
but every one of us is doing the very best we can in that moment. It, and and I find if you take that as a bit of a mantra for life, it's such great advice. It helps you to look at those situations that used to wind you up or frustrate you or make you annoyed or make you angry and kind of just take a breath and go, that person's having a difficult time right now. I can tell that because what's coming out isn't their usual behavior. It's not how they would want to be. So it does help you, I think, to to find that joy and to to be able to help and go with a helping mindset versus a judgment mindset. So amazing thank you very much for sharing um yeah queen brene um we love her um right what is one super practical bit of advice for our listeners that they could go and do today tomorrow the next day that you think would help them get more joy in their working lives stay curious i would say really really simply stay curious and playful would be the two things. Meet new people. Get onto Clubhouse if you're not on Clubhouse yet. Um, Clubhouse, if you have iOS, get on Clubhouse and dive into some of the incredibly rich conversations that you wouldn't normally be involved in. So what I mean, Beth, I was on Clubhouse the other day and I got joy from listening to a conversation about why black men struggle to get on with black women at times. For, like, When would I ever sit in a conversation like that and it just brought me so much joy to learn these different perspectives from different people around the world i haven't delved into the clubhouse world yet so i think i'm gonna see what i can do about that because it sounds like a, a great opportunity to get that perspective to learn from others and i'm always fascinated by other humans it's one of my um you know features of curiosity is i love it some call it nosy i call it interested <laughs> um i don't care which label you put on it but that that sounds great so yeah curiosity playful have fun talk to people amazing so um where can people find out more about you so thank you for that i would say the best platforms are probably linkedin you'll find me on there gary interpersonal catalyst you'll find me on uh twitter at gary ip catalyst i've got a website gary turner dot life g-a-r-r-y Turner one word dot life and if I may say I also have my second podcast going live yeah. next Monday which is actually the 8th of February as we record and it's called activating consciousness and we're going to be having conversations just like this like peeling back the onion and truly trying to get really really deep on systems um, which is something I'm being particularly courageous and brave about diving into because I don't know a lot but I really think as a, um, a white male on this planet, I really need to do some of that. And I really look forward to it. It's going to give me a heck load of joy. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure um, lots of people will get onto the podcast too. It's, it's one podcaster to another. Um, I am totally going to have a listen in and see um, all of the amazing things. And well, listen, I suppose, rather than see, hear all the amazing things that you've got to say and your guests. So, Gary, huge thank you for coming on the Work Joy Jam today. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I'm loving the practicality of the advice. And for me, that thing that's really landed is all of the stuff. If you focus on the team, if you focus on working with people and co-creating, the results that you can achieve are just amazing. And they almost just look after themselves. Yeah, beautiful summary. Absolutely. And thank you so much for the invitation, Beth. It's been amazing being with you and if I'm allowed to I'm just going to throw a little note out to our mutual friend uh, Jazz who connected you and I and I'm really glad she did yeah I, I love um, Jazz for connecting us and that power of the network and connecting with people is just amazing and always brings me super loads of joy so thank you very much Gary I hope you enjoyed the um, Work Joy Jam today and we will see you on our next episode Thank you all for listening to this episode with Gary Turner and thank you to Gary for being one of my guests and for being so open about his own personal experience and what he's been working on over the last few years. I think there are many interesting takeaways for me, but I'm just really interested, I think, on how as leaders, if you're working in an organisation, you can take some of these things and really use them to help you really excel in your leadership and to inspire people and to be able to see the benefits and reap the benefits of a more open, more trusting, more vulnerable, more innovative um, place at work. 
and I love how Gary talks about values I'm slightly obsessed with values so it totally links in with how I like to think of things but getting people really to understand them working through them creating them making it happen is so important and I think also one of the big things I'll take from it it was only a small comment but this idea that actually asking for help is a place where you can really really benefit and talks about getting insight knowledge and wisdom from other people and I really believe that and it's one of those things that we often really really see as a strength in other people but in ourselves we see it as a weakness and I'd love us all to think about how do we turn that around and ask for help more often and how do you keep doing these things for people setting those conditions for success in your organisation and knowing that that won't last forever, that sometimes you have to go back and revisit some of those things. So thank you to Gary for joining me today. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode and are able to take something from it and maybe go and make something happen in your world. Please do make sure you're following us on the social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook at Create Work Joy with Work Joy all being one word. And if you're interested in finding out more about the other things that we do, please sign up to our newsletter. You'll find the link in our bios. And also head over to the website www.createworkjoy.com if you'd like to find out more about my signature 16-week coaching program, The Workjoy Way, which takes you on a voyage um, to be able to create and cultivate more joy in your working life, wherever you are, whatever you do, whatever type of job you do, whatever stage you're at. It's something that can really help you there. And also to find out more about our club Workjoy, which is a fantastic community of people that we're building who also want to create more joy in their working life. Thank you very much for listening today and I hope to speak to you again soon.